So we were discussing Ochalorai. We talked about how the first half was done as thematic, um, and it was specifically done to show that Inuit are Inuit. That was uh, one of Peter Elnuk's phrases. That it doesn't matter where, there's certain things that define, speak to uh, Inuit identity. So that's that first part of the book. And then the second part of the book were the seasonal rounds, such as the uh, Amitomio seasonal round. So they were done very, to look at, uh, we tr worked really hard to try to uh, get the names of the different seasons for the different groups and to select uh, um, different communities from across Nunavut for inclusion in that second half and then sometimes even having to go and work with the communities. So the way that the book worked was that uh, John Bennett and I would bring together all the oral histories that we could find uh, and we would write up a section and then we would have a steering group meeting and we would present the materials to the steering group and we would actually go through it page by page by page talking about what should be included, what couldn't be included. Uh, sometimes the discussions came down to questions of who's the audience? The audience for the book in terms of um, when, a dis when an important decision had to be made for inclusion or exclusion of a topic, the, uh, the decision was based on a high school audience, particularly an Inuit high school audience. So if this was appropriate for, a, for an Inuit youth of that age and level of understanding and being in the world, then it was appropriate to put in the volume. So those decisions were made as we, as we went along. And um, we were actually really encouraged by the steering group to bring things in that normally would not be discussed, to, to bring in everything, because it was not um, up to us to, to make that kind of a censorship um, decision. It was up to the Inuit Steering Committee to make the decision as to what was at an appropriate level. Another really important decision that came out of that steering group was the fact that unless it was impossible, all quotations had to be, the authors had to be named, the speakers had to be named. And this was at a time when even still a lot of anthropology was being written where you didn't name people. You made up fictitious community names. You made up fictitious individual names um, in order to protect, right? It was always done under the rubric of protecting the individual, protecting uh, the community so, so that uh, the anthropologist who was writing their piece uh, wouldn't be casting any negative lights or causing any negative repercussions for the people that had shared with them. But the steering group was really clear in this particular case for Ukhalorait that the only way to judge for them a piece of information was to know who had actually said it. So we could bring in a quotation with an anonymous speaker and the response that would come back would be, I've never heard that before, I don't believe it. And if we brought in a quotation and it said, Noah Piratuk says, da 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 da, they'd go, I've never heard that before, but if Noah Piratuk said it about that region, then I'm, I'm prepared to accept it as something that I've never heard before. But, and I think, and then the decision would be, is that something that we include? Is that something that we exclude? Does it add to the story that is being told here? So it was a quite different way of approaching, and I think a really important um, way of, a, of approaching it. The other thing that was really tricky and difficult for us was the narrative break 
that occurs in the volume. So anybody that looks at Ukhalorait, it's a series of uh, quotations from uh, community members from Inuit with small, with we hope relatively small chunks of contextual information written by uh, John and myself. But of course the community members didn't speak in those breaks. <laughs> they didn't speak in those chunks. These are things that are abstracted from longer conversations. And whenever you abstract, you run into the thing of you're actually creating, you're breaking the story. So that was also something that was a concern of us all the way through the volume, was that we were taking specific pieces of information that went with a bigger story and removing them um, from that. And that's why it was so important to always have the steering group talking about uh, what was appropriate, what was inappropriate, where the context had got lost, where we needed to put more. Also where there was a need for repetition, where a concept was so important that where an editor might say, you have three quotes that are all saying the same thing, for the, for the steering group, it was really important that that, that piece of knowledge needed that emphasis, needed that reiteration to show that it wasn't just an individual's opinion, but multiple individuals saying the same thing, even if it's only in slightly different ways. So there were some, so those were some interesting challenges that we ran into with the volume, but also, um, really amazing opportunities. We also would go to some of the steering group meetings were um, held in Ottawa, but also some of them were held in different communities in Nunavut. And when we held them in communities in Nunavut, they were open for any community member that wanted to come in and listen uh, to the discussions. And then there were also presentations in the community. And we also took advantage of being within the community to also interview community members uh, who wanted to contribute pieces of knowledge uh, into the volume as it was being um, created. So that's part of what went on. Another thing that, so that was, that was it. And it was, as I said, it was really difficult, especially when we ended up with a 1200 page manuscript and then had to, that had been approved by the steering group. <laughs> and then the editors at McGill Queens went, that's a little long. <laughs> and then having to, then having to cut it and then having to always, by that time the project was over, to remember all the things that people had been saying and to try to stay um, honest and true to what had been shared by the steering group in terms of making the decisions as to what then the cuts that were made. So that was Ukhalorait and uh, one of the things that was always difficult about it was that it's in English. <laughs> and one of the audiences for it, one of the, the things, one of the, one of the hopes and dreams of the steering group when it was put out was that it would be a bridge for youth to talk with elders that people might have it at their homes and might be looking at something, right? Or a youth might be looking at it and then might start talking to cousin or uncle or grandma or grandpa and say, hey, what, have you ever heard this? What about this? And that would lead to a conversation. Um, of course, it being only in English, that only works one way. That can't work the way for, for a unilingual Inuktitut speaker. So actually, we're really happy that there was just a grant given for Ukhalorait to be put into Inuktitut. So we now are trying to piece, there, there were some interviews that were, where pieces were in French and English, so it would be translating them into Inuktitut, but then we now run into this really fascinating issue of Interviews that were originally in Inuktitut that have been translated into English, 
where we don't necessarily have the original Inuktitut and turning them back into Inuktitut. And that balance of how, especially when the deeper context around them isn't there. But that's for another day, but <laughs> lots of interesting things that are going there. But anyway, it's, it's really wonderful that it will be uh, in Inuktitut and add to the, the you know, because there's a, now a, a very, there are, now there's a, a much larger, wonderful body of, of literature out there than there was when the book first came out. So, yeah. What about the cuts? Are there cuts <laughs> which you think uh, we should put them uh, uh, in? Ah, maybe, <laughs> maybe. We'll see. We'll have to see. <laughs> we'll have to see as that progresses. I, but I, again, it's, what is it, 400 and something pages, so I think that probably, yes. But you know, that, that's another thing that has changed now um, with doing things online. You know, you can do things online. I know still there's, in, there's issues with the, with the digital divide, which still exists, and with uh, high-speed internet access and the problems of, of accessing materials, but even, you know, you can put much more content out there than, than you could before. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Yeah, so that was Ukhalerait. Just trying to think where we might go from there. I don't know. Where would you like to go? What did you do after? Uh, if we follow the chronology. Ah, if we so follow we the chronology. Okay, so if we follow the chronology, Ukhalerait uh, actually came out just after I got here to UBC, to the University of British Columbia, which was a really. Um, we had been in Pittsburgh for a number of years, and uh, we weren't actually necessarily looking to move, but the University of British Columbia was doing some hiring at the time, and they were uh, very interested in my husband. <laughs> and so they actually uh, asked him if he would be interested if they had a position in coming here. And he said, I would only be interested in coming here if there was also something for my wife to do because she has been working all this time, but she's also been looking after the, the kids and really it's time for her to have an opportunity for her career. And so negotiations went from then onwards because it was straightforward. It, it was in the days when spousal hiring was again something that was really uncommon and so uh, the university um, created two positions, which is, again, something that I fell into and I'm really very, very grateful for. <laughs> so I felt very, very, uh, very fortunate. And uh, then I was able to come here and my position is a joint position between the Museum of Anthropology uh, so I'm 75% in the Museum of Anthropology and 25% in the Department of Anthropology. So I'm a curator here and an associate professor in anthropology. And so I get to teach, I get to have graduate students, and I get to do exhibits, work with collectors, work on repatriation. I get to do a myriad of different, absolutely phenomenal um, opportunities that I get through, through being in both places. So in uh, 2001, I was really uh, fortunate to come in and join the wonderful crew here at the Museum of Anthropology and in the Department of Anthropology here at the University of British Columbia. And uh, when I got here, one of the things that happens, I think, in any position that you first start is people look around and go, oh, there's somebody who doesn't necessarily have a full plate and due to, um, due to an incredible tragedy, um, I was given an opportunity to do something that, again, was one of those uh, career-changing um, opportunities. When I um, arrived here, shortly after I arrived here, uh, David Pocatillo was head of the anthropology department here, and he lost his daughter 
in a diving accident uh, in uh, just near here. And there was a memorial ceremony for her that was held here, right where we are right now. And because of the relationship between the museum and Musqueam, and I'll talk about that on the next tape. Because of the relationship between the museum and Musqueam, and the work that David Pocatillo has done with indigenous communities, um, it was, uh, Musqueam was asked to provide someone to act as the MC for the memorial ceremony. And Shane Point uh, came up came from Musqueam to act as the master of ceremonies. And I was asked to uh, take Shane around that evening. And so I took Shane around. And uh, at the end of the evening, he, he shared with me that he had never been to that. It was an incredibly moving evening. So it was full of students from UBC. The whole of the hallway was full. People got up and shared stories of this wonderful um, young woman and um, her untimely passing. And Shane was an incredible master of ceremonies for the event. And afterwards he said, you know, I've never been to a memorial ceremony like this. This is not how we do memorial ceremonies. He said, this was incredibly moving, but this is not my culture. And uh, and I said, oh, that's, I said something to him like, oh, that's really, that's really interesting. Can you tell me a bit? And he shared a little bit about memorial ceremonies in, in his culture, and we had a nice conversation. And shortly thereafter, he came to the museum and he met with Ruth Phillips, who was then the director here. And he said to Ruth um, that he had attended this memorial ceremony and it had really moved him made him think about the memorial ceremony that he was planning for his sister. And he said his sister loved children and loved education. And if he, he said that at the end of the ceremony that he was planning, they had some choices that they could make. They could take some things that had been gathered for the ceremony and they could gift them to the people who were at the ceremony they could burn them at the end of the evening. There were a number of things they could do. And he said, if the family donated them to the museum, would we do an exhibit about memorial ceremonies and the meaning of these ceremonies? And that showed that Musqueam is still here and still practicing their culture, which goes back to the theme of continuity. And so um, Ruth brought a number of people together and discussed it, and this opportunity was handed to me to work on this exhibit with a group of graduate students uh, in the Critical Curatorial Studies program that had just been started. And so we, were, we spent hours so we went down to Musqueam, we talked to the band council about the possibilities of doing this. And they said, as long as you make clear that you're working with the Point family, uh, this is Shane Point's family, and that this is the way their family does the ceremony, that's fine. You can go ahead and do the exhibit. And so Shane then spent, that summer he spent 60 hours talking with us about the ceremony, about his plans for the ceremony, about what the ceremony meant, about uh, educating us because he said we needed to understand as the people that were going to be creating the exhibit. He said, he said, you know, we are from, you know, he said, uh, this is our family, this is the way we do it. We're sharing this with you. This is our expertise that we're sharing with you. You're the museum people doing exhibits. That's your expertise. 
but you need to understand, you need to know enough to know what you can and can't say. To have subtleties that point to the community that you understand where the lines are. So he sat and talked to us, and I have still somewhere in my room uh, a sheet that's about 16 feet long and four feet wide of the day that he came in and gave us his family's genealogy. For five hours, I was writing, triangle, circle, equals, kids, generation after generation after generation, showing us to demonstrate the connections, right? To make the point that in the exhibit came down to about one sentence, as it tends to do in exhibits, which was Shane saying, as part of this ceremony, there are about 3,000 people connected to this ceremony for my sister, right? But he was demonstrating to us how those connections came to be. So that to me was an, was an experience that you almost never get somewhere that sharing is so deep. And then also he would come in and he was also trying to show to us how you work with community. So he was, I was getting, as, as the new kid on the block, who has never worked in this part of the world. This to me was completely new experience. Working with Inuit communities and working here are very, very different. And he was giving me a crash course on, you know, how to behave, how to be respectful to people here, how to listen for silence, how to try and read. Uh, and this is, this is true in many cultures, is, is listening to silence is almost impossible. But you have to try to listen to silence because in every community, silence sometimes means yes, sometimes silence means Sometimes silence means no, and sometimes silence means we haven't made up our minds yet. And as somebody from outside, trying to listen to those silences and trying to understand which silence is being employed when is critical to the, to the fieldwork experience. And so Shane was trying to show us and demonstrate to us uh, by how much he was willing to share with us what those silences were and how to listen for them. So we then were able to, we then were invited to the actual ceremony. So we got to attend the ceremony and then at the ceremony where there were about, there were about 800 people in attendance at the ceremony uh, for his sister. And at the end of the ceremony, they stood they brought the canoe up, and at that time, uh, Michael Ames was there, and they actually, because Michael had had a long relationship, Mike, the, who was the director of the museum, um, had had a long relationship with Musqueam, they actually stood Michael up and said, we are giving the canoe to the Museum of Anthropology with all its contents for them to do an exhibit. And I'll just explain because I'm allowed to do this, that as part of the ceremony, in, in the ceremony they had placed, a, they had had a canoe built for the ceremony. And in the canoe they had put things that spoke to their sister and her life, the things that were important to her. And so those things also came to the museum. So the canoe and everything that was in it came to the museum for us to put on display. And it was, a, it was in, a, in, in a space just behind us here originally. It's still, part of it is still on display. But in its original installation, this exhibit was one that made everybody stop who came by it. And so frequently when you, that's what, you, as a museum curator, that's what you want, right? You want something that makes people stop. People stopped because what they saw was a canoe, which in Canada stands for indigenous people. And then 
They, so they saw the canoe, but then in the canoe, they saw a Terry Fox t-shirt. In the canoe, they saw an Elvis Presley frig, fridge magnet, an Elvis Presley memorabilia. They saw a Hawaiian shirt and a book of pictures of Hawaii. And they saw a burnt bark canoe baler and piece of rope and weavings. And so, and, um, and also quarters. And so there were all these questions that the visitors had as they came through. What's Elvis Presley doing in a canoe, right? What's Terry Fox doing here? And it made an immediate connection with the visitors to get across that sense because it's something that is really difficult to do in an exhibit, to deal with affect, to deal with emotion. And that exhibit did exactly that because people would stop and they would read the labels and they would understand. Everybody understands losing someone you love, which was where this exhibit started, right? It started with the tragic loss of a young woman and someone thinking about the loss of their own sister, the connection that they felt across culture that they both understood. The loss of a loved one is such, you know, such a strong feeling that's cross-cultural, that this canoe spoke to the visitors about that. At the end of the canoe, at the end of the exhibit, we had a memory box. We had a book that people could write memories in of loved ones. It started with a poem written by Shane Point about his sister and his love for his sister. And people then would write in it. We had a memory box where people could put their memories and we would then promise not to read them. So the memory box, which we then took, the memories that were in the memory box. Uh, so this, was, this is an incredibly powerful exhibit. It was up for a number of years. As I said, we, we reinstalled it. Parts of it are still, still here. It, works in a, it doesn't work in quite the same way that it did. But it still has that draw for people of what's going on here, why are these things here. I, and it also makes that very strong demonstration of today. This is happening today. Elvis Presley is now. Terry Fox is now. Not something that happened in the 19th century in the far distant past. So to tell the story of the memory box, because it's again another one of those things that you never imagine. So we have these memories inside the memory box. What do we do with them? Well, as part of this museum, every now and again, we have the museum cleansed. So that's a spiritual cleansing. That's a good story. After the a cleansing, after the space is being cleansed, spiritually cleansed, Whoever's doing the cleansing will get a sense of the building, sense of what's happening, and sometimes there's a need to feed the ancestors who are around. And we were doing a, a feeding for the ancestors, which in this area uh, involves burning food. And so we went down to the family and we said, uh, what do we do with these memories? in the memory box that we've promised not to read. And they said, well, next time you have a burning, they will be the layer of the paper that you put in to help the fire burn before you, so in the wood. I said, okay. So uh, Gina Grant, Shane's sister, came up the day that we were doing the burning and was there when the wood was laid out. And she said, okay, now you have to take the memories out of the memory box. I said, okay, so we just laid them down? She said, no, you have to open them all up and put them face up. So here were the, all these memories that we'd promised not to look at and not read. And here am I as an anthropologist, having to open them all up face up and not read them. This is really difficult. 
but there were amazing things. So people had put money, people had put origami, people had put all kinds of things in this memory box and written pages and pages. And so we just opened everything up and didn't read them. And then they actually got to go up in the, in the flames um, for, the, for the fire to go back as the messages. So that was the, the part of that, that exhibit. So all of that was a, a part of my experience when I first got here, and that's what I mean by sometimes when your plate isn't full and you arrive somewhere new, you have these amazing things that just, opportunities that just, that, that, that just come forth and, and, and uh, yeah, change the course of what you're doing because my experience there, the generosity of Musqueam people, Shane and Gina and Larry Grant and others in the community later on, Larry, Leona Sparrow in Howard Grant in educating me and saying, you know, have you thought about this? It's, and it's not, it's not done as in it, the way that it, it's done is such a gentle way of trying to teach you. So I'm going to tell two stories now. And the first one I'm going to tell is the first burning, uh, first cleansing I did of this building because it can also show you uh, how as an anthropologist you can make all the wrong decisions. So thinking that you've done everything right. And also how you have to keep asking questions because you don't know. And sometimes, the, and for me that's the hardest thing. Remembering to ask questions, not being embarrassed that I don't know something that is so hard right because people look at you and go you've got gray hair you ought to know these things right and so so sort of saying i i don't know this so the i again it was you, my my plate wasn't full and uh said you know we haven't had uh the building hasn't been cleansed spiritually for quite a while and it's probably time we do it so sue you should do it oh what does that even mean? Right? I don't even know what that means. So people here said, well, this is what it means. And you go and you talk to Musqueam and they'll tell you who to approach. And uh, you know, then you'll go and approach the person and then they'll come in and they'll do the cleansing. So, okay. So I got in touch with Musqueam and I said, so who should I approach? And they said, um, and the person that had been doing it for years and years and years and years had passed away before I arrived here. Just relatively before, not too far in the, before I arrived here. So they said, well, unfortunately, um, you can't approach this person because he's no longer with us. So we would recommend that you go and talk to Danny Charlie. So where, does, where is he? Well, he's out in New West. So. So I phoned him up and I said, hi, I'm, this is who I am. And he said, okay, I don't know you. And, uh, and I said, well, I've been asked by the museum to arrange uh, cleansing, but I don't know what this is and I don't know how to do it. And I don't even know how to ask you properly. And he said, oh, okay. So you're gonna come out to visit me and you're going to bring me some tobacco. And he said, and for, he said, this is how I do it. Not, not necessarily how anybody else does it. So you don't think that you've learned, right? But for me, you bring tobacco, you put it on the table when we're having our conversation. And if at the end of the conversation, I take the tobacco, that's a signal to you that I will, I will come and do the cleansing. This is very nerve wracking, right? Because you don't actually know whether somebody's going to say yes or no. So I go to the grocery store and I buy the tobacco, which of course raises the eyebrows of everybody. But I buy the tobacco and I go out to him and I put the tobacco down on his uh, table in the office building that he works in. And we have this long conversation and he wants to know who I am and where I'm from and why I do what I do, right? You know, who's my family? And so I'm trying to answer all these questions for him. 
And then we get to the stage where we're talking about the cleansing and what's the space that needs to be cleansed and who determined that it needed cleansing. Uh, so we talked about um, how some people had been feeling in some of the spaces and, and so he said, okay. And uh, how big was the space? So we talked about that. And then, it, and then sort of after I'd been there for about an hour, he sort of not, he sort of thought about it and then he slid the tobacco over to the other side and took it. Right. And then a couple of weeks later, I hadn't heard from him. So I called him up and he said, oh no, now you're supposed to call me and arrange a date. I go, okay. So, <laughs> so I arranged a date and I talked to him and I said, so, so what do we need to do? He said, well, I'd really like there to be no one in the building. And I'm brand new here, right? So I've never done this. So I said, okay, so is there a reason why? He said, yes. He said, we disturb, you know, as we go through the building, we'll disturb some things that are in the building and we don't want them to accidentally bump into people and make people sick. I'm like, okay. So I go to the staff here and I say, um, so Danny, Charlie has said he'll come and do the, the burning and uh, he would like there to be as few people as possible in the building. They said, well, that's not the way we've done it in the past. He said, well, this is how he would like to do it. And everybody's like, okay, so the museum is closed on a Monday anyway. So we'll just ask everybody to stay home on Monday morning and work from home. So we can't not have security in the building. And there are some people that need to be here. So they'll be here. So we, are, we arranged all of that. And I talked to various people who'd been here for cleansings before and I said, what does it actually look like? How does it actually happen? And they said, well, you know, um, he'll, he'll come with um, cedar boughs and uh, probably some water and, and some, some red ochre and he'll probably come with some helpers and you'll need to have envelopes with a thank you in it and you'll need to have some gifts and you'll need to set up lunch um, for them afterwards, but no food beforehand and you'll need to have basins for water and things like that. I'm making all these little, you know, you know, academics, we make our lists, making all my little checklists and I'm getting everything ready and I'm saying, okay, so water and cedar, okay, water and cedar, okay, fine. And I talk to conservation and they're all on board, right? This has been done before. This is not something new. You don't have to worry about the fresh cedar boughs being brought into the collection spaces and, and all these kinds of things and the water and, and, and that. So he arrives on the day and comes in and uh, he has some cedar boughs with him, but he also has a frying pan. And I'm looking at the frying pan. I'm thinking, okay, so what's going on here? And he said, oh, well, I burn herbs. I burn sage and other materials. And that's part of the cleansing that I was trained to do. So that's what I do. So I'm going to go through the entire museum and the collection storage space with the frying pan. And so I have this collection of herbs and then I just feed more herbs into the pan as I go along, brushing the space down with the songs. Can you imagine where this is going? <laughs> so we start doing this. I'm very naive, right? We start doing this and we're going through. And fortunately, this is before the museum had its current sprinkler system because we get about 15 minutes into it and all the fire alarms go off in the entire building, right? Of course, right? He's got a frying pan, he's yes. <laughs> right? And there's this wonderful, wonderful aroma. And this. So we're down in the collection storage area with the lights flashing and the alarms going off. And I'm going, I, do we evacuate the building or don't we evacuate the building? And Danny's going, no, we just keep going. <laughs> and about five minutes later, who arrives in their entire kit? 
but the Vancouver Fire Department, right, in all their fire gear with their hoses, and they're, they're, oh. and they go by, and there's Danny, and he's peacefully going through, doing his work, cleansing the area, getting rid of the, the, the bad spirits that have accumulated in some of the spaces, the bad feelings that have accumulated that need to be drawn out of the building. And the fire department people are brilliant. They go through, they stop, they look at us. I explain to them what's going on. And they go, okay, continue. <laughs> and head off. But that's the first time I did was responsible for setting up a spiritual cleansing in this building. And you can imagine, <laughs> not what I had anticipated, but everything else went smoothly and they were able to remove the things that needed to be removed from, from the building and to make this a better feeling space.